Friends, good morning and Merry Christmas again. It's good, uh, it's good to celebrate the feast day of St. Stephen with a, with a deacon, and because, uh, you know, Stephen was a deacon. And then you've also got the, the mention of the wailing and grinding of teeth, and he goes, hmm, under his breath. <laughs> the dentist deacon. Well, friends, here we go. So this is what I want to I, I reflect on, that on this feast of St. Stephen, right, when God gives... When God gives the total gift of himself, right, when God gives the total gift of himself in Christ, it elicits out of us, it's meant to elicit out of us a reciprocal gift of self. I guess this is what I'm getting at, that like, even though it's jarring, right, on the first day of Christmas, it shouldn't surprise us that the day after the, the, the Lord's nativity, every year we are invited to this, to reflect on the feast of the martyrdom of Stephen, right? We have Christmas yesterday, right? All of us with our families celebrating all the beautiful masses, the church is still decorated beautifully, and then we come to December 26th, and we're wearing red, not to be festive, we're wearing red because it's the feast day of the blood of a martyr. And that's jarring, but it shouldn't surprise us. Because what do we have yesterday? We have the feast day of the Lord entrusting his heart, giving himself to us in creation. It's the total gift of self. And it elicits out of us, as it did out of Stephen, a response, the reciprocal gift of the total gift of himself. It might be helpful, it might be helpful to recall that the manger... The manger that we reflected on yesterday with the Feast of the Nativity, it's organically related to the cross. Like the entry point of Christ into creation, the first throne he chose was the manger, and the final throne he chose was the cross. And both of them are places of offering, right? He came into the world into a town known as Bethlehem, the house of bread, because he said of himself, I am the bread of life. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life in him. He comes into the world declaring, I have come to feed you. I've come to give myself to you. And on the cross, it, it's, it's, it's as if it's the, the little melody that began to be sung in the beginning is brought to this crescendo on the cross. It's the same song. It's the same self-offering, right? This is a baby who did not come to live. This is a baby who came to die, as Fulton Sheen says, that the shadow of the cross, this long shadow of the cross is cast all the way back to the crib. He says of himself, I came to offer myself as a ransom for many. I know, I know in many of our manger scenes, and pretty much probably all of our manger scenes, and in our all imagination of the manger scene, when we picture the manger, it's this little wooden trough, right? Raise your hand if you've got a wooden trough in your mind when you think of the manger, right? Wooden trough. Okay, I'm going to do a little archaeological, historical retooling of the truth here. No one, no, one, no one throws stones at me as I try and, you know give us the truth about this. This is some beautiful stuff that I learned last time when we were in the Holy Land, Deacon and, and uh, the Allens and some of the other folks from, from Sacred Heart when we went to uh, the Holy Land back in February? February, yeah. All coming up on a year. Okay, you have to know this about the Holy Land. Because of the temperate climates, animals like sheep and goats and those sorts of things, they, they're able to graze year round. They're able to graze year-round, which means that shepherds, innkeepers, those sorts of folks, they don't need to have these vast storehouses of straw and hay to feed animals in colder winter climates like we have here in North America. So what was a manger? It wasn't necessarily a feeding trough, and it wasn't necessarily made out of wood. You think about what... what uh, you know, what would sheep or goats, what would their teeth do to a wooden feeding trough? Their teeth, they would, they would chew through the thing, right? You find archaeologically all throughout the Holy Land, you find these stone mangers, these carved out stone troughs. And what were they used for? They were used primarily for water. 
They were used primarily for water. Because think about it, the animals, they can't, they can't use the wells in town. There's no like goat lowering the bucket down through the well, right? So it's the, the herdsmen, it's, the, it's the, the shepherds who retrieve the water from the well, fill the troughs, which were made out of stone, and that's what, in many ways, that's what likely the manger was. I know it kind of wrecks our image of this little trough in the hay, but it was more likely a stone piece of construction carved out as a trough for water. But then there's something really striking about that. There's something really striking about the image of Christ, the newborn, laid upon this stone manger as upon a stone altar. He comes to give himself. Like just as he will in this Mass, just as he does in every single Mass, he lays himself down upon the stone of our altars to give himself away. And when we receive Jesus, as we've always received Jesus, when we receive Jesus, we are receiving his entire Paschal mystery. Our yes, our amen is a amen. Yes, I want to conform myself. I want to receive his Paschal mystery. This is why we're celebrating St. Stephen the day after the Lord's Nativity. Right? St. Stephen, who says yes to the beauty, the glory, the mystery of Christ, who then in his very life and death is recapitulating the paschal mystery of Christ. He's even taking to himself the very words of Christ, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Right? That's St. Stephen. And there's one aspect of his martyrdom that I want to draw our attention to. One specific verse. It says this, Filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen looked up intently to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they, the persecutors, they cried out in a loud voice. They covered their ears and rushed upon him together. They threw him out of the city and began to stone him. The witnesses laid down their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. It's that line, they covered their ears. They didn't want to hear him. They didn't want to hear Jesus. And they, right, they won't want to hear us either. They don't want to hear us. Some will, as some did, but many won't. And we shouldn't be surprised. We really shouldn't be surprised. What does Jesus say about in the gospel? He's telling us, about the world that's going to hate us because of his name, that will persecute us and drag us before synagogues and will cause division. He says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before you. And we must respond as he did, as Stephen did, and love them anyway. This is a world that is broken and corrupt and beloved. <laughs> is the point. We cannot just dismiss the world. We have to love what God loves. And he says, I love this world. Friends, I'm just going to ask is that we spend some time meditating on this, that the world wants, the world wants Christian values, but it hates Christ. The world is desperate for Christian hope, but it hates Christianity. The world needs the vision of truth and goodness and beauty. The world needs all of that which our faith orients us to, but it, at the same time it rages against us for our supposed intolerance of things that are false and ugly and evil. The point of the martyrdom of St. Stephen is that to stand with the baby king is to be enlisted. It's to enlist oneself, to be willing and ready for the world that doesn't want to hear the only thing that everybody in the world is desperate to hear, which is the gospel, right? The hope that comes from Jesus Christ. And the only thing that has ever broken through to this world that's covering its ears and shouting aloud is the witness of a love that's willing to suffer for the sake of the world, for the sake of the world. I will suffer your hate out of love for you. And it's the only thing that's ever worked to convert the world. Don't believe me? Ask the guy who consented to the stoning of St. Stephen. We call that guy St. Paul. 
the blood of the martyrs is always the seed of Christians. It's the thing that's warm enough to melt the coldest hearts. Friends, I want, us to invi- I want to invite us to reflect deeply on all this today. The interconnection between the manger and the cross, the king and his soldier, and where do we fit into that? Amen.